Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Christina Ilvento. I'm one of the product managers for Google App Engine. And I'm Dan Holyvote. I'm an engineer on the developer relations team, also focusing on App Engine. And today we're here to talk to you about building mobile App Engine backends for Android, iOS, and the web. So a little bit about why we're here. We're really here to talk to you about using Google App Engine as a backend for applications with multiple clients, clients on your phone, clients in the browser, and also to introduce to you Google Cloud Endpoints, which we announced yesterday in our App Engine overview session, which is a feature that makes it even easier to develop client applications for your App Engine backends. So we've talked about, about why we're here, but why are you all here? Um, as a show of hands, how many of you have built an App Engine app before? Wow, okay, we've got quite an App Engine crowd here. Um, and how many of you have built a mobile app before? All right, excellent. Anyone who's built a mobile app backed on App Engine? Tried, Tried. okay, great. <laughs> um, so chances are, you know, you're here to learn a little bit more about App Engine, to learn about building applications with multiple clients in general. But regardless of the specifics, you're probably here because you're thinking about building an application. Um, and you're thinking about building an app because you've got a great idea. You've got the kind of idea that gets you onto you know, the front page of your favorite news, news source on the web, um, something that people talk about around the water cooler. Or maybe if it's not something really aspirational like that, at least it's an idea that you think is gonna make you a million bucks. Um, so, uh, so you're here to build an app, and, and you know that this thing needs to be everywhere your users are gonna be. This thing needs to be on multiple platforms. We're not talking about a 90s-style website here. We're talking about an app that goes everywhere that your users go. And beyond that, we're talking about an app that needs to scale. Um, chances are you're not gonna make a million bucks on your mom's book club. Um, so you want this thing to be able to scale up so that when, when all of your, your users start using all those, those multiple platforms, your app scales with them. Um, so keeping this in mind, we have an app that needs to work on multiple platforms, it needs to scale. We come up with an idea for what our architecture is going to look like. It probably looks something like this, where you have a single backend that has your application logic that's actually talking to some sort of shared state, um, some storage, and maybe some other fancy services. Um, but on top of that application logic, really the core of your application, you're probably standing up an API. And that API is gonna be called by all of your client applications running on um, iOS, Android, and in, in web browsers. And this seems like, like a pretty reasonable design. Um, so let's go ahead and start to actually build this thing, make it work. Um, so the, the first thing that we're gonna do is probably pick, a, pick an open source stack and, and stand this up maybe on a server that we have lying around in our basement. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do, we'll stand up Apache, we'll stand up MySQL, get those two playing nicely together. Um, and, and we're essentially ready now to, to actually start building the core of the application now that we have our open source stack set up. So we start to, to actually implement the application logic. Um, and so once we get the core of the app, written, we have to actually figure out what this API is going to look like, and you figure out your API methods, write all the service class code that you need to have that API actually stand up. But now we get to a point where we've got to figure out some of the specifics of the API. Um, it's not just figuring out what methods you're going to use. We have to figure out how are we going to authorize our clients? How do we know who's calling our API, and are they allowed to be calling our API? How are you going to authenticate your users? How are you going to authenticate users on a device? and have that actually be communicated to your back end in a way that you can securely handle user data. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have ever tried to do this in the past, but it turns out that it's not exactly trivial to make that work. Um, what are you gonna do for compression? How are you gonna make, um, how are you gonna decide what wire format to use? There are a lot of things that come along with building an API that you have to manage before you can even get in to building those client applications. Um, but you've got this great idea, so we're gonna assume you're a smart guy. Um, and you've, you've figured this out. You've actually stood up the API, you're ready to go, and we're ready to start building our client applications. Um, so as you start to, to build these, maybe you build them all at the same time, maybe, maybe you build one at a time, but as you start to build the client application, you probably don't want a lot of that API-specific code sitting around in the, in the logic of your client apps. So what you're probably gonna do is factor that out into some sort of API wrapper code. So at this point, we have our three clients they all have some wrapper code, and every time we make a change to our API, and chances are we're gonna make a few as we're developing this great app, we have to make that change now in three places, 
in three different languages, um, for our Android app, for our iPhone app, and for the web. Um, but again, uh, we're, we're smart developers here. We've, we've got this working. So at this point, our, our app is ready to launch. We, we've got it. We've got the client apps talking to this back end, and, and everything works. Um, so we launch. And, and before we launch, we probably do some, some fancy math um, to figure out what, what our load is going to look like and figure out how we're going to provision and all of that. Um, but it turns out that being good at math is not the same thing as being able to predict the future. Um, and chances are, you're either going to over-provision and end up provisioning a lot more than you really need, or you're going to end up having, having some really fun downtime and getting to send out your, your first post-mortem to your, to your beta users. Um, so when we get into a situation where essentially what you're doing is you're actually going through your development process, and then every time you're ready to actually add more users, or whether you're ready or not, you're adding more users, you need to go through the cycle of estimating your load, provisioning, actually setting up all of the hardware if you're buying hardware, um, or, or, or provisioning VMs, and then actually being able to launch. In addition to all the overhead and maintenance of just keeping your API up to date with all of your new versions. So at, at some point after, after we've um, been working on this app for a while, we realized that what we're really doing is playing sysadmin and really spending a lot of time working on the API-specific aspects of this um, and spending a lot of time kind of figuring out load balancing and, and all of that rather than doing what we really set out to do, which was to build this great million-dollar app um, and, and do things like actually figure out a monetization strategy, you know, add features, improve our clients, all of that. Um, but let's pause for a minute. Um, I promise that this talk is not completely depressing. Uh, App Engine can really help with this. So with App Engine, it's really, really easy to get a scalable backend up and running quickly. Um, so if you're not familiar with App Engine, I know we had a lot of folks raise their hand, um, but many of you didn't. Um, App Engine is our scalable web hosting platform that lets you take advantage of the robustness and scale of Google's core infrastructure in your applications in a fully managed environment. And it's really easy to get started. All you have to do is download the SDK, write your code in Java, Python, or Go, and then you can test it locally using our local development server, and then upload it to, to Google and, and run your application um, on Google's infrastructure. So scaling is, is um, a really important part of, of writing an app like this. Um, and it turns out that, that scaling is actually really easy on App Engine, and it's rare that important things are easy, so this is great. Um, so with App Engine, uh, as the traffic for your app increases, we automatically provision more instances and actually spin up more instances to handle that traffic as your traffic increases. And the great thing is that you only pay for what you use. So you get both the benefit of scaling, uh, of reliable scaling when you need it, but you also get efficiency when you don't. And beyond just the scaling, because you're running in a fully managed environment, you don't need to worry about your full stack. Um, what version your kernel is running, no longer your problem. All you need to be worrying about is the actual application logic that you're deploying. Um, so this is great, but App Engine is more than just sort of scaling in the fully managed environment. With App Engine, you get a great set of core features that help you to put, um, to ha that help you to build a real feature-rich application quickly. So with App Engine, there are several storage options that are already baked in. You can use the App Engine data store, which is a NoSQL data store, um, without any configuration or setup um, already baked into your app. And you can also use Google Cloud SQL with our integration with Google Cloud SQL. Um, and that, then they started taking open signups, I think, yesterday. So you have storage that's already built in. You also have some great compute options. So things like task queues and cron jobs, are, you don't have to configure, uh, you don't have to manage all of that yourself. It's all just built into App Engine. And beyond that, App Engine has some great APIs and services included. So things like the user's API. So you can authenticate Google users in your application. Um, that's all included in App Engine, as well as things like MapReduce, Search, um, and Mail. So you don't need to go out and find an open source solution and worry about integrating that into your app. It's all there for you in App Engine. All right, so we've taken the lightning tour of App Engine. Let's use that for our back end. Um, so now using App Engine as our back end, what we'll do is we'll, sh we'll have that shared state be stored in data store. Um, we'll write all of our, app en our application logic in an App Engine app. And then we can use any of those, those APIs and services as well. And so now at this point, we're, we're both um, taking advantage of the scaling uh, of App Engine so we don't have to worry about managing all of that ourselves. Um, but we're also sort of getting this thing done more quickly because we didn't have to do all of that setup and configuration hassle at the beginning. Um, 
And so th this is great. Uh, and, and, um, and so now we don't really need to worry as much about the back end. But what about the, the rest of this architecture diagram that we have up here? Um, that we, we're still having to, to manage that API ourselves. We're still having to deal with all of the, sort of the wrapper code and, and the things in our clients. Um, so we, I know I promised you at the beginning we'd talk about endpoints, our shiny new feature of this talk. Um, and so let, let's get right to it. And let's skip slides while we're doing it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so with, with endpoints, you can extend your App Engine backend using Google's API infrastructure. So basically, the way it works is that you can annotate your App Engine backend code to stand up an API, and all of the configuration and service classes are generated for you. You don't have to handle any of that on your own. Um, and then you've got an API up and running for all of your clients to call into. And another great feature of endpoints is that you get custom client libraries. So rather than dealing with all of that wrapper code yourself, instead you get to generate client libraries. So you can get strongly typed Objective-C or Java client libraries for your API that you can use in your mobile clients, as well as dynamically typed libraries for JavaScript that you can use um, for your browser apps. And um, the, final, the final great thing about this is um, th that we have OAuth 2 support. So figuring out the, the sort of client authentication and all of that is all handled for you with endpoints. Um, so if this, this slide was not um, dense enough for you, uh, let's walk through how this actually works in your App Engine development process. So the first thing that we're gonna do is actually write our backend code. Um, and we write this the same way that we would today. Um, so what we have up here is just a basic Java sample with a game and, and one method to update the game. Same way you would write a, a Java App Engine app today. And the next thing we do to get our API is we annotate it. Um, and all we have to do is, is add this add API annotation to actually turn this into an API. So from here, the configuration for the API and the actual service classes are generated for you. You don't have to do any additional work. At this point, you've done all you need to do to actually stand up this API. Um, but now let's get on to the clients. So we've got our API and we're gonna write our clients and this is, um, this is just a, a little snippet of what you'd see in the command line if you were generating an Objective-C client library. So we provide tools to generate those client libraries either in the command line or um, through an integration with the Google plugin for Eclipse. Um, so at this point, we, we now have our strongly typed Objective-C client library. We can pop that into our client app app, um, and then we're ready to go, and it's that simple to actually get the, the API up and running and into your application. Um, so I walked you through the basics of how endpoints work, um, and I'm going to hand it over now to Dan, who's going to give a more detailed walkthrough and show you some of the code. Great. Thanks, Christina. So uh, a lot of you are probably wondering what our million-dollar app idea is, and sort of kill the suspense, it's a tic-tac-toe game, which I'm sure is gonna make us tons of money. So let me just load up a sample of what this type of app looks like uh, on an Android device here. So I have it running in the emulator. Uh, this, is, this is working on Froyo, works on Froyo and above. Um, and so I've got the simple board layout here. I can click on these squares, and every time I, I click on one of these squares, what it's doing is it's sending a request to our App Engine backend with the, oh, wow, awesome. <laughs> I checked right before the demo, I swear. Um, it's, it's sending off a request to our backend server with the current board state, and, uh, and then the computer's gonna make a move, send the request back to the, the App Engine app, or sorry, to the Android app. We're gonna update the UI with the, the uh, computer's move, and then we can keep playing. So let, let's do that here. All right, so, you know, we're, all right, we've got this nice little option here for, for multiple moves. All right, looks like I won, awesome, great. So this is gonna send it off to uh, another API that we have running on App Engine, which is keeping track of our previous games. It's recorded my victory for posterity, and then it shows it up at, at the bottom of the screen. So let's look at the code for what this app looks like. So we'll start with, with the App Engine backend. And as I said, I have two APIs running. The first one of those APIs is keeping track of the state of the board. Uh, and the second one is a really simple resource that keeps track of, of the high score. So what we're looking at here is a uh, simple model for the data store. We're using JDO. Uh, this is exactly the same code that you would write today if you were writing uh, an App Engine app uh, that, that wanted to keep track of something like a high score, right? This is exactly the same model and everything uh, that you're used to writing. So we have a couple properties here, things like uh, the outcome of the game, when we played it, uh, some getters and setters and things like that. So that's all very straightforward. Uh, and then as a companion to this, we've written 
an endpoint class, which we'll use uh, to interact with the model in the data store. So we have some simple um, methods here for you know, getting one of the scores from the data store, or listing all of the scores from the data store, or inserting a score into the data store. And again, this is all code that you're probably very familiar with writing if you've written App Engine apps in Java in the past. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we're going to turn this into an API, and we'll do that by adding a series of annotations uh, into the code. So the first one of these is the at API annotation. And actually, as soon as I've added this, this is actually enough to give me an API uh, that I can use inside of my Android app. Right? But there's some, some small improvements and tweaks that I can make to it if, if I want to make it a little more customized. Uh, so the first one I'll do is I'll give this API a name. This is part of tic-tac-toe, so we'll give it the name of tic-tac-toe. And then the next annotation we can add, and, and again, this is completely optional at this point, is the API method annotation. And we can use that to give uh, each of our methods a name. So we'll call this scores.get, and uh, we'll do this for the other methods as well. So this one is scores.list. Right, this is all very straightforward. There we go, we've got three nicely named API methods. And then there's some other things that we can also use the API method annotation for. So one of those, uh, for example, if I wanted to do user authentication uh, inside of my application, I could add some, um, some customization options for OAuth2 inside of the API method annotation, so I could do things like uh, provide a list of client IDs that would be uh, acceptable as, as consumers of my API. I could add an audience field if I only want to accept requests that were coming from a certain audience, things like that. And then once those are in there, I can add a user parameter into my API method, which will give me a user object that I can then use inside of my backend code. And this is exactly the same user object that you would use if you were using the, the built-in users API that's part of App Engine. So it's exactly the same uh, behavior. It's the code, uh, sorry, it's the it's the API that you're used to using. Uh, we're not adding anything custom or, or special here. Um, so if you have uh, other pieces of your project that use the user's API there, this is completely compatible with that as well. So for the purposes of the demo, we'll leave that out uh, just because it makes things run a little bit smoother in, in as far as my demo flow. But you know, again, it's, it's very simple to add uh, authentication to your backend. So this class is basically finished at this point. Uh, and just quickly, I'll show you the, the board endpoint class that I've made as well. Uh, again, we have only one method here, which is just allowing us to get the move from the computer. Right? It's part of the same API. We're using the API method annotation here as well. All right, so now that we've got all this code written, we can run this application locally. So I'll just hit the play button here uh, in Eclipse, and it'll spin up a local server. Great, it looks like it's running on, on this port. And then we'll go into some curl commands that we can uh, try out the API locally. So the first one of these uh, that we're going to show you here is, um, is a command to test the board API. And so what we're doing here is we're passing in uh, JSON blob, which has the current state of the board. So we're representing the board here as a, a one-dimensional array uh, of, of squares. I've set the middle square to be an X and I'm sending that to the API that's running on my local machine. And if I hit return here, we get a response back. The computer has played one of the adjacent squares with a, a, an O, and then we can you know, use that in whatever applications we, we would like. So that, that's really convenient. Uh, it makes it really simple to test these APIs as you're developing them. So that's cool. Uh, so let's, let's actually try deploying this to App Engine. So we'll use the Google plugin for Eclipse here. We'll hit the Deploy to App Engine button inside of Google plugin for Eclipse. We'll hit the Deploy, and then we'll let this go in the background. Hopefully the network will cooperate with us. It won't take too long for this to go through. All right, just checking to make sure that the API is running and the backend is running on App Engine. All right, great. And so now we can flip over to one of the tabs where I have the application running. So one of the Christina, uh, one of the things that Christina mentioned before was that um, all of these APIs are built on the same API infrastructure that powers lots of Google's other APIs. So things like the Google Calendar API or the Google Plus APIs that many of you are probably familiar with. And one of the things that binds all of those APIs and makes them, um, 
you know, very easy to use is this common discovery format that we have provided for all of the APIs. And basically what this is, it's uh, a JSON description of each of the APIs that's being hosted by Google's infrastructure. And the same way that we have those for Google APIs, we have those for APIs built with Google Cloud Endpoints. So you can see here, this is the discovery document for the API that I just deployed. And if we scroll through this, you know, we have descriptions of all of the uh, methods and the objects that I'm returning from any of these API calls, what the expected inputs are, things like that, which we can then use inside of Google's other tools. Uh, and so one of those tools that we can use is the Google APIs Explorer, which many of you have probably tried uh, for, for, again, things like the Google Plus API. When you're learning about a new API and you just want to try it out before having to write too much uh, client code. So I've loaded up the API Explorer here with my tic-tac-toe APIs. And if I click on one of these APIs here, so let's look at the, uh, the get move method. I can fill in a sample request to the API. And again, we'll use that same board that I was showing you before where I've played in the middle square. We can hit execute. And then this is going to send off a request to our API. You can see what that request might look like uh, if you were inspecting the packets in something like Wireshark. And then you get the response from the API as well. And this looks very similar to what we saw when we were just testing it locally, uh, except the computers decided to play in a different square. So that's really cool. And one of the pieces that the API Explorer is built on is the JavaScript client library, which we provide for Google APIs. And using that same technology, we can then go and build a uh, web front end for the tic-tac-toe game, uh, again, using this exact same API. So I've written an application like that here, uh, which you can see it's got a, a very simple board interface. And if I click on one of these squares, it'll send a request off to the computer, the computer plays, so on. Uh, but one thing that's interesting about this is then you can go and inspect these requests as they're going on in the background, and you can look at the contents of the requests that I'm sending, as well as the responses uh, from each of those requests here, too, which, again, makes it really easy to develop uh, these applications if you are writing them in, you know, say, Chrome, for instance. So we'll play again here. Uh, looks like... I am a winner again, awesome. So this is gonna send off a request again, recording uh, another victory, and hopefully the background, yeah, there we go. It's loaded both the, the previous game that I played on the Android device as well as my most recent victory in the JavaScript app. So I bet a lot of you are here not because of your desire to build web applications, but your desire to build Android applications. So let's take a look at what this might look like if we were to add this behavior to an Android application. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to return to our App Engine project. And uh, using the Google plugin for Eclipse, we're going to use this new feature we just added, which says Generate Cloud Endpoint Client Library. And if I select this, what this is going to do is it's going to read all of the annotations that I've uh, added to my backend classes, send them off to Google. Google is going to generate uh, some API configuration for me and return a client library that I can then use in any Java application. So it's, it's done that now. It's, it's loaded this file here. And if we go and look at it inside of the Finder, uh, we can see all of the things that it's generated for me. So we only have one API. It's uh, v1, right? So we only have one directory here. And if we expand this, we can see all the things that it's created for me. So the two things that are most interesting to you here probably are the libs directory, which has all of the libraries that I would need to run this in basically any Java environment. So this isn't just the jars that we need to run on Android. It also includes jars for running it uh, on another App Engine app or other Java environments. And so I have an uh, Android app that I've created here as well, and I've already loaded in a smaller set of those libraries uh, into this directory already. And one thing I should add is that uh, the Java client library also works with ProGuard. So you might be looking at this and say, oh, well, that's, that's a lot of stuff. Um, but it actually compiles down to a very, very reasonable size uh, when you're using ProGuard. And then the second thing that we've gotten here is a set of source files uh, which we can use to interact with the API. So I will copy these into my App Engine project here. And then if we go back into Eclipse, refresh this directory here. All right, it's loaded those files in. And now we can update this sample activity that I've created here, which will allow me to interact with the API. So to show you a, sort of a sample of what these API calls might look like, uh, I've constructed a service class uh, 
above here in this, this activity. Very straightforward, right? And so once I have done that, I can then use it inside of the rest of the activity class to generate calls to the API. So what we're interested in here inside of this asynchronous task is the computer's next move. So I will make a call to the board API. So we'll call service.board. And then I'm interested in the get move method, which is great. And then we've been passed in uh, the board state here in this, in this object. And then we'll send it off to the server. All right, so it's really simple to call these API calls using the generated libraries. Uh, we basically have a one-liner here to make a call to my backend. So now that that's added, we can then compile this app uh, in the background um, and hopefully load it up on, on my Android emulator again. So we'll just give that a second. Switch over to this here. My poor little computer has lots of things running, so this may take a, a second longer than normal. All right, so this is the app that I just built. It's all also already loading in the previous games that I've played, and if I click on one of these squares, then it's sending on the request off to the server, and again, we're playing tic-tac-toe. Pretty neat. Uh, so there's a, another uh, mobile development platform which some of you guys might have heard of, and maybe you're interested in developing for that as well. So let's look at what this might look like in the iOS development case. Uh, so we have, in the same way that we have a, a generator for the Java client library, we have a generator for Objective-C as well. So I'm gonna call that here using one of the discovery files that was generated from my API. So what this is doing is it's, uh, again, reading that discovery format that I talked about before and generating a set of uh, header and implementation classes that I can then use inside of uh, an application in Xcode. So these are all the files I need here, and we can just copy these into an application that I have set up. I've got a little directory for them already. We'll just drop those in there. And then in the same way that I showed you in the Java case, we can paste in uh, an example API call to get the next move from the computer. So we'll just start writing here. So we're interested in querying the tic-tac-toe API, and we want to query for the board and pass in an object. Autocomplete is super helpful here. So. Uh, all right, great. So we have that written as well. And then if we hit run, again, this will compile in the background and then fire up the simulator. All right, we've got all of my previous games again loading at the bottom. I'm on a roll today. And I can play again, running. Oops. <laughs> yes. All right. Presenter's luck, what can I say? All right, so. So now, now we've gotten uh, uh, clients written in, in three different languages, uh, running on three different platforms. And to just show you what this looks like uh, as far as the development experience on the uh, admin side, we can then look at the requests coming in from each of these platforms. And you can see here, uh, we've got at the top, we have uh, requests coming in from the Object Objective-C client. Below that, we have some requests coming in from the Java client library, which is the one running on Android. And looks like we've got some people in the audience who are also playing, that's awesome. <laughs> And then if we go back to the previous page, we can see some requests uh, coming from my laptop here running the Java, JavaScript client library. So, so there you have it. Uh, simple, applica uh, simple app engine backend powering uh, mobile application running on the web, iOS, and Android. So if anyone in the audience is interested in trying out and doesn't want to copy the URLs themselves, uh, we also have some handy QR codes here that you can load up and play. So with that, I'll hand it back to Christina. Great, thanks, Dan. I'll give everybody a minute to, to scan those QR codes and see if you can, can beat Dan's really awesome record for, for this run through of our talk. Um, all right, looks like still a few people trying to get it 
Um, so, the, so this is really, really powerful, what, what Dan just, just walked us through. We were able to get in the space of sort of this, this talk and with admittedly a little bit of copy and paste magic, um, a real application up and running with multiple clients. Um, and so for, for tic-tac-toe, um, really what we did here was we actually wrote the backend code the same way we do normally in our, in our normal app engine development environment. We were storing our previous games in the data store. The game logic for the, the computer to make its next move was just a regular app engine app. Um, and then Dan showed you how you might use the user's API um, to actually add that OAuth support in as well. Um, and then we, we just annotated the board and score classes to actually generate the API configuration that Dan showed you um, and, and the service classes and actually created our, our board and score APIs. Um, and then we were able to generate the client libraries and Dan showed you both how to do the, the Objective-C on the command line as well as using the Google plugin for Eclipse um, to generate the, the Java client libraries. And then we use those to write our client apps. Um, and, and so in, in the space of, of the few minutes uh, Dan was up here, we got our, our tic-tac-toe app is, is off the ground and we're ready to launch. Um, so with, with endpoints, you get some, some really great features. So you can write your backend in Python or Java, and then you can use the annotation-based configuration to actually set up your API and then get the OAuth2 support. And then on the client side, you can get generated client libraries in Objective-C, Java or JavaScript um, for iOS, Android, or your browser. And then you get, you get the great tools, and Dan walked you through quite a few of those. So you both get the App Engine Dev App Server so you can test your API locally as part of your normal App Engine testing process, as well as the, the integration with the Google plugin for Eclipse for generating client libraries and, and sort of your natural Android Java flow as well. Um, and then the other cool thing that you get um, sort of uh, as a benefit of being built on top of Google's API infrastructure is you get some of the tooling that's available around Google APIs, like the APIs Explorer, which is, is a really great way to, as you're just sort of designing your API and, and starting to test it out, to, to play around with, with the API during your development process. So endpoints is, is, is really great for actually building a, an, an application with multiple clients. Um, you get the scalability of, of Google's infrastructure. You get the same scalability that you're used to with App Engine, as well as the scalability of Google's API infrastructure. Um, if you're familiar with some of the Google APIs, like Google+, YouTube, um, they're handling billions of API calls per day. And your API for your client applications is getting the benefit of that scale. You also get the flexibility of multiple clients and the flexibility of choosing the endpoints that are meaningful to your application. So you're not restricted to things like CRUD operations or any particular sort of data type or having to fit your application's logic into some sort of mold of an API. You really create the API that makes sense for your application. And then finally, you get the simplicity, which I think Dan, Dan showed pretty well, of just needing to annotate and, and then you're done. You've got your API and you get to continue to use your normal app engine development process. There's no need to go out and, and find some other way to do an API, find some other way to do auth. It's all very seamlessly integrated into your normal app engine development process. Um, and so maybe, maybe you're thinking like, all right, it's, it's scalable, what, whatever. I mean, you guys wrote tic-tac-toe, very cute. Um, but it turns out that um, on you know, your Android phones, if you all are using the I.O. app, that the I.O. Android app is also written using endpoints. So when you actually installed that app um, and chose which account you wanted to use and got, got your session scheduled, all of that is running using endpoints. And so we've had some really good success using this internally to Google to, to actually create some of our applications. And so we're really excited today to open this up to trusted testers. Um, so if you all are interested in, in getting early access to endpoints, um, excellent, people are reaching for their phones to scan the QR code. Um, please do, do scan the QR code and sign up at endpoints-trusted-tester.appspot.com. Um, we're, we're really pleased to, to be making this available to you today as, as trusted testers um, and let you all try it out and, and build your million dollar app ideas. Um, because it, it turns out may, maybe ours isn't going to make a million bucks, Dan. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so I'll give every, everybody a minute to scan, scan that QR code. Um, and if you want to get like even earlier access, Dan is going to be running a code lab tomorrow at 11 a.m., I think in, the, in code lab room one. Um, and he's going to walk you through the, the finer points of, of building the tic-tac-toe app and, and help you get this up and running for yourselves so you can see um, to see what that's like. And there are a couple of talks later this afternoon um, 
that are also going to touch on endpoints. Uh, so Brad and Ido are going to be talking about HTML5 in App Engine at about um, 1.30. Um, and then Yaniv and Sriram are going to be talking a bit more about the Android side as well as some of the authentication stuff that we didn't get to go through um, today uh, uh, at 5.15. And then the, the code lab that Dan is going to be running tomorrow. Um, all right, so that about sums it up for, for what we had for you all. So thank you very much for coming. Um, I think we have, we definitely have some time to take questions. Uh, and then again, here are the, the QR codes for the, the web version, the, the Android version, and, uh, and the trusted tester sign up. But if you'd like to ask a question, please do come up to the, to the microphones on, on either side. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. So, when you when you develop a multiple uh, when when you develop an app that runs a, a product that runs on multiple clients, you have a data structure and objects and stuff like that. So, for example, there's Java on the on App Engine, Java on Android. And sometimes I see the objects get built, get generated uh, as a result, get generated from the API and not the other way around. So how do we tackle this? Like, I have the same structure in all the places, but I need to build it again. Um, because I, because I, because, this approach goes from the API point of view, not the object's point of view. I, I sure. So, Dan, do you want to? Yeah. So, in this case, it's the, the API, the, the objects that are passed by the API are described by the code that you're writing, right? So, the score class that I showed on the, the App Engine side, if you already had an object and you wanted to use that as the basis for your API, you could do that, right? So, the discovery format that's powering all of these things behind the scenes is interpreting your object in an, and then writing client libraries that will read and write to your object format in the correct way. Right? So, so you have an object, an object class in, in a Objective C, an object class. Right. So, so we generate a class in Objective C for you that's matching the object that you've created on your server. Okay. So and I, I need the. So perhaps it's for the code lab, but I, I need to fill in the the actual the the actual actions. So is it generated that I can fill in without overriding my code every time the API is generated? Yeah. So the the endpoint class that I showed you, you're in control of all of the code that's in that class. Um, but that's generated. No, that, that oh. wasn't generated. Okay. Right? So that was a class that I had. We actually do offer the, the, uh, the ability to generate automatically an endpoint class for you based off of an object. So I could have automatically created a class on the, you know, to interact with the score object. I didn't show that here, but you could do that. Mm -hmm. uh, the way I was showing it, though, you're in control of all of that code, and you're just annotating it to describe the way that your API should be built around it. OK, thank you. Yep. Maybe take one from the other side? Hi. Um, so I was wondering, you guys have support for the annotations on Java and Python, but what is your plans for supporting Go in this? So right now, we're, we're only making this available to trusted testers in, in Python and Java. Um, so we don't have any specific Go support yet. Um, but I, and I don't think we have any in particular planned, uh, but stay tuned. We'll definitely update you as, as we make support for more languages available. And I just had one more question about uh, supporting multiple languages in the same app. Uh, I know for right now there's a workaround where you can push a Java version to one, to one version name and uh, Go or Python to another one, but do you have any plans for supporting multiple languages in the same app? So. You mean just an app engine in general? Or? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, for App Engine in general, um, maybe find us in the, in the sandbox afterwards, and, and we can talk in a little more detail about, about your particular app. Sure. Thank you. Thanks. Cool demo. Um, my question, I, was, I noticed um, after you generated the 
client side library um, that you had, there was like it was like in a folder with a version like v1 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about how the versioning is handled. So you know, as like you were going to add the user parameter, for example, like would that cr when you created the next version of the client library, how does how is that managed? Right. So the the at API annotation also allows you to control things like the versioning. So if I wanted to say this is v2 that I'm deploying now, I could add a, a, a version parameter into the API annotation there and give it a different version, and I could have both deployed simultaneously. So if I had a client that was still calling v1, that would still go back to my old v1 code. And if I had a v2 client, I could have that point to a different set of code. I see. Cool. And then the second question is, let a few more people leave the room. Uh, any plans for a Windows Phone client generator? <laughs> I know, it sucks, but I have to do it. <laughs> I don't choose to do it. <laughs> um, no, no concrete plans okay. at, at this particular moment. OK, thank you. Um, but you could, I mean, if you wanted to just call it as a REST API, there's no reason you couldn't call it from, from Windows Phone, but, but no particular plans to support that yet. Thank you. Other side? So two questions. Mine is sort of part of his. So for Windows clients on tablets and things like that that are coming out, it sounds like there's no plans for C Sharp or any .NET client generation. Um, so we don't have support for that at the moment, um, okay. but we, we are thinking about the, the additional languages that we're going to provide support for. So if you sign up for our trusted tester program um, and, and give that, that feedback, um, that, that will be really helpful to us as we continue to develop it. So the other question I had is with the Google Compute Engine mentioned this morning, are, do you see scenarios where I can deploy that plus this using endpoints together, or is those seen as I'd have to expose a REST endpoint from there to be able to deploy with this? So I have sort of a worker role doing something there combined with a front end that, that's provided by this. Oh, so you'd have like, you'd stand up an API on top of App Engine using endpoints and then have your compute engine yeah. instances call into that? Yeah. Um, that's not something that, that we've particularly been targeting. And I think that, that there's probably going to be additional development around, around there. But that's certainly something that you could do, because it, you can just stand up a, a basic REST API. And if you were writing some Java code, you could just use the Java client libraries. So there's nothing that would prevent you from doing that. OK, thanks. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question about authentication. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so it's obviously using OAuth, and probably on Android side, you can use the account manager and use the user account, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But sometimes you don't want to authenticate the user. You just want to make sure that only your app can talk to this endpoint. You don't mm -hmm. care about the actual user. So just making sure that nobody is calling your API and racking up your bill and whatever. So do you have any support for this? For example, like the App Engine has the service accounts. Mm -hmm. So anything similar for mobile clients, like an application account or the user account? So the, the client IDs and audience field that I was talking about as, as possible things you could add in mm -hmm. to the API method annotation. Uh, if you have your client specifying, you know, or, or sorry, if you have your client uh, represented by one of those client IDs, you can then say in your API method annotation, I only want requests from this client ID to be accepted when the, you know, they're calling the back end. So mm -hmm. then any other person who's using a different client ID, their request would be denied when the API is called. OK, so but the, the client IDs is like actually authenticated. <coughs> it's like not just anyone can reverse your app and copy the ID and do the same thing? Or? Right, so, so the, the client IDs are set up through the Google APIs console. Ah, OK. Um, and then there's a, a, some improvements to the account manager that are mm -hmm. going to make that process work end to end on Android devices as well. OK, so is there any like documentation about this yet? or? Um, so definitely check out um, Yaniv and Sri Ram's talk later today. I think mm -hmm. that one was at 515. OK. Um, uh, and they'll be talking a bit more about the auth there. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So if I have uh, server-side resources with uh, you know, child object collections, the generated libraries have any sort of helper facility to do lazy loading of, of those kind of those larger collections that are attached to the resources that I'm accessing? That's a good question. Um, I haven't checked into that specifically. Uh, maybe if you find us after, we can investigate a little more in, into that particular use case. Okay, all right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great. I do a ton of development around the calendar and documents API. And typically, when I'm interacting with that service 
from Python, for example, I have to implement uh, exponential back off and retries. The API just hiccups for one reason or another. If I'm writing my own endpoint, should I implement similar back off and retry? Like, should I just expect it to fail just for the heck of it? That sounds like a reasonable coding practice, just in general. Um, uh, expect that the worst will happen every once in a while. Um, but in terms of like a, a specific, like is there a retry already included or anything like that? And maybe we should, should chat in more detail afterwards. Okay. Yeah. So there's, I mean, there's some, there's some bit in the client libraries there, but I, I think it probably warrants a, 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 a longer discussion. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, are there any uh, plans or problems with integrating the JavaScript libraries with GWT or GWT? Are there any problems with it? Uh, like having a wrapper around it so that uh, GWT services or widgets can easily call these same services? I haven't tried that. Yeah, I haven't looked into that much. Okay. Um, okay. So stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I missed the first part of the talk, so I, maybe you answer this. So, uh, does does it have any support for caching or throttling of clients requests? Like for abuse of one client, start calling too much often to so the you, API. So, caching on the client side or caching? Uh, no, no. Uh, but sorry, were two questions. Does it has caching support and also throttling in case of abuse? So right now, I don't think we have any throttling support. Um, but on, as far as the caching goes, so one of the, the demos that I showed when I was calling uh, the APIs Explorer, uh -huh. there's an e-tag that's passed with each request. And you can use that on the client side to you know, not basically not re refresh the content every single time that changes. So if you, you just say, give me the e-tag, then you don't have to re request everything again. OK, and caching on the server side, when main cache or something like that? Uh, so then it's just a, an App Engine API, right? Or an App Engine app. So you can do whatever type of caching you want uh, on the back end. So App Engine supports memcache, so you can use memcache. If you want to create some sort of more complicated caching hierarchy, you can do that too. OK, thank you. Oh, very exciting demo. Thank you. Um, so our company works on uh, like a client server application that handles a tons of vehicle network data. And uh, I spent a lot of time um, doing, sending out database uh, queries and all that, tons of them. Um, I was wondering, um, since I spent so much time profiling the uh, database performance, um, if, I, if we happen to port our existing server into the Google App Engine, um, do, do you guys like provide some sort of um, executables that you can run to monitor the, uh, the performance or and all that? I mean, there's there's app yeah. stats. Okay. Which which does basically I think what you're looking for. Okay. What what was it called again? App stats. App stats. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. So it looks like we've exhausted the the questions from the mic. Uh, anyone else brave enough? All right, um, well, thank you again very much for coming. Um, and please feel free to find us in the sandbox later. We will be around. Um, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, guys. Thank you.